We are continuing our study titled The Mind, The Arena of Faith, and it is based on a book written by our very own apostle, Frederick Casey Price. Now, the last time that we were together, we were truly discussing the armor of God. And there were just certain questions that were brought up in what we had read in scripture. And we ended up reading, actually we ended up in Ephesians 6, 14 and 16. So turn to Ephesians 6, just turn there, because we need to kind of at least make sure we're all on the same page. So turn with me to Ephesians 6, and we're going to look very quickly at Verse 14, are you there? Just let me know if you are. Okay, and I'm going to share it with you out of the Amplified. So this is Ephesians 6, verse 14, out of the Amplified, and it says, So stand firm and hold your ground, having tightened the wide band of truth, personal integrity, moral courage, around your waist, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and upright heart. And verse 15 says, and having strapped on your feet the gospel of peace in preparation to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news. Verse 16, above all, lift up the protective shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then we also read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8. So I want you to turn with me there. And I'm going to share it with you first out of the Amplified. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. And the Amplified says, But since we believers belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope and confident assurance of salvation. And of course, the message I really like, and says, but friends, you're not in the dark. So how could you be taken off guard by any of this? You're sons of light, daughters of day. We live under wide skies and know where we stand. So let's not sleepwalk through life like others. Let's keep our eyes open and be smart. People sleep at night and get drunk at night, but not us. Since we're creatures of day, let's act like it. Walk out into the daylight sober, dressed up in faith, love, and the hope of salvation. So if you compare this verse or the verses that we just read in 1 Thessalonians with those in Ephesians, it would appear that when the Apostle Paul was writing it, he was confused with his use of symbolism. And this we spent some time talking about last time. Notice that in 1 Thessalonians, in what we just read, chapter 5, verse 8, he refers to the breastplate of faith and love. Everybody got that, right? That's how he describes it. However, when we just read Ephesians 6, 14, he calls it the breastplate of righteousness. And most of us always think of it as the breastplate of righteousness. Um, but if the breastplate of faith, which one really is it? The breastplate of faith and love or the breastplate of righteousness? So if we look at verse, in Ephesians 6, if we drop down to verse 16, he refers to the shield of faith. But then again, in Thessalonians, he says it's the breastplate of faith and love. Now, is he saying all this to just confuse us? Because if you're sitting it, you're reading literally and you're not studying you're just reading, and remember we talked about there is a difference between just reading something and actually studying it. What, what exactly is he saying? Well, here's what we did figure out. In comparing 1 Thessalonians with Ephesians, it is obvious that Paul did not remain loyal to his Roman soldier symbolism of comparing each piece of the armor with something that a Roman soldier wore. It seems that it didn't matter whether it was the breastplate of faith or 
the breastplate of righteousness because he interchanges them, all right? So if the symbol was to be the breastplate of righteousness, then it should be breastplate of righteousness everywhere he mentions the breastplate. But there seems to be something else that's going on. So all of this brings us to specific questions that demand specific answers of us in order to bring clarity to the whole armor issue, like just how important is the armor to begin with. So Paul refers to the breastplate of righteousness, then he refers to the breastplate of faith and love. So we want to know which is it. So here are some of the questions that we went over. Number one, what is the armor that we are to put on? I Meaning actually, what is it? And then number two, what exactly is it to be used against? I mean, we're supposed to be putting on this big old suit of armor. What are we using it against? Third, what does it protect? Because that's important to know too. Because if you're gonna put on, I mean, go back and think of this big old <laughs> armor that we're supposed to put on. We need to know what is it protecting or why are we bothering with it? And how is the armor to be used? So we all understand that we have an enemy, correct? Would everybody agree with that? Yeah. But why do we need armor? Why do we need the helmet, the breastplate, the shield, the sword? What do we need to gird our loins for or shod our feet? What exactly is the armor to be used against? Since Paul did not remain loyal to his soldier's symbolism, it may be time to downplay its importance. So what we proposed and we did last time was a very simple procedure that will assist us in looking beyond the soldier symbolism. This procedure requires us to remove the, the Roman soldier from the passages of scripture that we just read in Ephesians. In other words, take out all of the soldier emphasis. And for the sake of clarity, let us remove the terms loin, girt, breastplate, feet shod, helmet, and sword, and let's just see what's left. So we're gonna take all that out, and now we're gonna read it and see what we have. And this is what it says. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having truth, having righteousness, having the gospel of peace. Above all, taking faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take salvation and the word of God. Now, doesn't that sound like something we can apply and, and totally understand without having to deal with that whole armor issue? Okay. Notice that it says, and this I really like, is that it promises or it says that it will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. How many things are left out of all? No. Nothing. So we have that assurance that it's going to quench all of the fiery darts. Now turn back to Ephesians 6, and we're going to look at verses 10 through 18. And this I'm going to share with you out of the Message Bible. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. And just listen to this. This is wonderful. And that about wraps it up. God is strong, and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. There is no afternoon athletic contest. This is no af athletic afternoon contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll be still on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up 
so that no one falls behind or drops out. Now, what I like about that, you know, sometimes you'll see a movie like, it could be like a war picture, and it deals with Marines, and you know how they have a saying, never leave one behind? And you will actually see in a war picture where somebody's gotten shot or injured or whatever, and they go out, even though they're in harm's way themselves, to drag their fellow soldier out of harm's way. Now, don't you think that's interesting? They don't profess to be Christians. So if we are brothers and sisters, aren't we, should, shouldn't we do at least the same thing? If you see one of your brothers or sisters, they may be growing through something, but they could be in a lot of agony and pain. You don't just step over them and keep walking. You go and you help them, because whatever it is that they happen to be in the midst of, you know what? So are you, because we're all part of the same body. But I don't think we always think of it that way. So that's why we're at Bible study. <laughs> so it gives us a different way to think of it. So once the soldier terms are removed, as we just read in the message translation, and we get rid of all the soldier translations, it suddenly becomes apparent that the armor that we are to put on is the armor of truth, righteousness, gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. That's our protection. It's not physical armor, people. That's not the protection. The protection is the word of God. It's just that plain and simple. Amen. Truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the word of God. So is Paul telling the Christians at Ephesus to put on salvation? Chapter 1, verse 1 of Ephesians tells us to whom he is writing, the saints who are in Ephesus. But why would Paul, because again, we got to ask this question, why would Paul tell Christians to put on salvation? since Christians are already saved. Then he tells them to put on righteousness. How can that be? Because Christians are already righteous, correct? In fact, turn to 2 Corinthians 5.21, and let's see what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this, and I'm gonna share it with you. Well, if we look at it in the New King James, it says, are you there yet? Okay. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The easy to read says, Christ had no sin, but God made him become sin so that in Christ we could be right with God. The Amplified says, he put Christ who knew no sin to judiciously be sin on our behalf so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. That is, we would be made acceptable to him and placed in a right relationship with him by his gracious loving kindness. And last but not least, the message says, how, you ask, in Christ? God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong so we could be put right with God. So obviously, that's saying we're righteous, correct? So Paul couldn't be telling Christians to put on salvation and righteousness every day. What would happen if you were rushing one morning, you know, you got up, you're trying to catch that train that you know comes at a certain time, and you forgot to put on your salvation? <laughs> We'd walk around all day unsaved. I don't think so, okay. If he's telling us to put on righteousness every day and we got in a hurry and forgot to put on our righteousness, we would walk around all day unrighteous? Surely he couldn't be saying that, could he? Okay, no. Paul is not telling us to put on our salvation every day, but he is telling us to put on daily what we know about our salvation and what we know about our righteousness. See, that makes a big difference. Give you a scenario. If you are on the train and a fight may ensue and there's a whole lot of mess going on, the old you might have wanted to get involved in that. You might have wanted to get involved in that. You might have had some words that were colorful. Many of them are four letters, okay? That really are not 
the, the letters or words that we would use in the Bible. Okay, can anybody relate to that? But you see, if you know that you're saved, then you have to keep your flesh under and remind yourself of who you are and just be still, okay, and let the Lord handle or do whatever. You just don't get caught up and go back to what you used to know so well. So the point being is, that's what he's trying to tell us. What we know about our salvation, what we know about our righteousness, that's what we're supposed to put on daily. And you do need to put it on daily. And this is just a little side note, which doesn't have anything to do with this. But you know how we, you hear us say all the time, call those things that be not as though they were. I don't think we really realize that you can call something into existence, meaning we read certain things, but again, we're not taking a moment to let it simmer <laughs> and meditate on it to figure out what that means. You have to know your salvation, and you've got to call on it, okay? You've got to put it on. It's important that you do that. For instance, if you are in the conference room, and I need you here, right now, and I don't have an intercom system, I can call out and believe that you're going to hear me, and then you're going to come and see what it is that I'm beckoning you for, asking you about, correct? Well, think about this. You might be in the midst of your body being under attack, and you can't figure out what's going on. The doctors are special, okay, because they may not have an answer for you either, but you can call healing to come forth. You can call whatever it is that you need to come forth. Whatever you are in need of, it's in your mouth. Call it forth and expect that it's going to happen. Now again, that's a side note, but I still think it was good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> I liked it. I think it was good. So anyway, back to this. Go, turn with me to Hosea 4. Does this make sense? Go to Hosea 4, 6, because we already know this. If you don't know what's involved with your salvation, then <laughs> beyond just being saved, you really don't know enough to be able to be successful in this three-dimensional world in which we live. Okay, it's not enough just to know. It's wonderful to make the decision to be saved. There is, that's great. I mean, nobody's going to ever downplay that. But you've got to go beyond that decision to become a disciple. And in order to become a disciple, you've got to study to find out who is Jesus. It's not about religion, which you've heard me say before. Religion is just another nice way of saying bondage, what you can do and can't do and all the rest of that. That's not what being saved is about. It's about relationship. It's about finding out who your Savior is. What is his personality? What is, what, what's going on? What does God really want? to do for you? What does, if anything, he wants from you? You have to find that out. And it's so interesting to me. We'll put in all kinds of time with our friends, with our mates, with somebody we want to be our spouse, all of that. We'll Courtship, we'll go all out for that. You know, I mean, we'll put in a lot of work for that. But then we don't put it, we just kind of put our relationship with the most high God on the back burner, and we don't know that much about him at all. You're hurting yourself. He's already done what he's going to do, and he loves you with a love that's beyond anything that you can compare to. You just don't know. So we need to make sure that we're not destroyed for lack of knowledge. We've got to find out what's going on. So let's go further. What does Paul mean when he says, put on truth, put on faith, put on the gospel of peace, put on the word of God? I submit to you that the armor that we put on is the armor of Bible knowledge, not Bible reading. Because a lot of people get caught up in that too. Okay, well, I got up and I got the devotional calendar that was posted on Facebook, and I read chapter so-and-so, and so and so i am happy for you. You can sit up and tell me you read 10 chapters a day. Praise the Lord. What can you tell me that you learned from those 10 chapters? I would rather you tell me that you read 10 words that you got something out of that you could apply to your life that made a difference than tell me how much you read. There is nothing to... Quality is more important than quantity. That's why studying 
is more important than just merely reading. Now, I'm not knocking you for reading. Praise the Lord. I'm happy that you're reading. But I want you to just go up another step and literally study so that you understand what it is that you have read. So what do you know about your salvation? What do you know about your righteousness? What do you know about the gospel of peace? <laughs> what do you know about faith? What do you know about the word of God? Paul is telling us that if we desire to win the warfare of the mind, which is our thought life, we must put on what we know about our salvation. Then we are to use what we know about our salvation against the enemy as he attempts to destroy us through our thought life because we already know that's where he starts his attack because he doesn't... He has no authority over your physical body. He could try, okay? But you know what? If you, if you're, we're having like, well, our seasons are real special here, but imagine a normal change of seasons, okay? As the temperature is very interesting. You know, it might be 61, and then it's like 25, and you know, when I left a, a few weeks ago, I went to go to the airport the day before, it was almost 70 degrees. I got up, it was 24 degrees. I'm like, this is so weird, okay? So I mean, the weather is kind of different, but the point being is, if you start getting sniffles, you know, and you might kind of like your throat's a little bit irritated, that's the enemy trying to attack your physical body. Now, it's how you react to that. If you sit up and turn on TV where they're going to have Vicks commercials and all kinds of, you know, tissues, special tissues for the season, and everybody in the world thinks you need to get a flu shot and a pneumonia shot now. I don't even know if they had that. But they have all this stuff. And if you're over a certain age, like many of us are, you needed to be running down. They give them out to you free. Think about that. See, I have... Anytime the enemy is giving me something for free, or in this world system they're giving me something for free, I question it. Okay, that's the first thing. But here's the point. With your little sniffles and your little throat that's a little, you know, how do you think about the situation? Do you sit there and start thinking, wow, I probably am coming down with a cold. You know the temperature just changed. It was a little chilly. Oh, my goodness. Now, you might not have even said it but you're still thinking it, which means it starts where? In your thought. Then, oh my goodness, you start sneezing on top of the runny nose. And then it's like, oh, somebody says bless you. And you're like, yes, thank you. Well, you know, and before, I'm serious because this is being authentic. We don't want to think about it because we're so super saints. You know, we're here Bible study on Thursday. But seriously, go back and think about it. You know, and then you turn on anything, the TV, or you just get on the, the subway and they got all of these big things sitting up talking about, go get your free flu shot and this and that and the other thing. Before you know it, you start believing you have a cold. You start literally because it starts here. And then after that, you start actually saying, well, you know, I'm going to go downtown. Maybe I should stop and get some NyQuil while I'm there. OK, you actually are starting to create the situation. And it all starts in your mind. Or you could turn that thing around and say, mm, OK, let me go have a cup of tea, put a little honey in it. That'll be great for my throat, because I like tea anyway. And you know what, enemy? I am the healed of the Lord, so back off. Because any germ that touches my body dies instantly because I am the righteousness of God. Now, it's two different ways of looking at it. But I submit to you, we, because we live in this wonderful three-dimensional world, we go the first way, not the latter way, more often than not. So that's what we've got to start working on and training ourselves to do. Okay, because everything starts here, and that's how the enemy can get you. He can't just come and roughshod and make you lay down and have the flu. Can't happen that way, but he certainly can start with how you look at it in your mind. And you just have to be authentic with yourself and realize that there's a lot to this, to what we're sharing with you. So, when you put on what we know, about all of these different things that we're talking about. When you use your knowledge of all of these things properly, you will not fall prey to the wiles of the devil. His fiery darts will no longer carry out their destructive work in your lives because that's his whole, 
<laughs> emphasis, okay? <laughs> if we are to avoid becoming another casualty of war, we must put on and properly use the true armor of God, which is Bible knowledge. Remember that Ephesians 6.14 talks about girding your waist or your loins with truth. And then verse 15 talks about the gospel of peace. Verse 17 talks about the sword of the spirit, which we know is what? The word of God. But what's the difference between the word of God, the gospel of peace, and truth? Right. There is no difference. It's all the same. It means truth is the word of God. God's word is truth. And the truth is the gospel of peace because it's the good news, what, about the truth. It's how well we use what we know about our salvation, about our faith, about our righteousness, about the gospel of peace and the word of God that determines whether we win or lose this warfare that Paul keeps talking about. We already know that God always wants all, and we already determined nobody's left out of all, right? So he wants all of us to always win. Amen. He's done everything to make sure that we always win. But it's up to us to go ahead and do that. Now here's another thing that I want you to think about. And that is knowledge and its proper use wins battles. <laughs> We're all assailed every day by things that inspire our thoughts. And we talked about that. The TV is great. You see, we're also living in a different time than the generation before us or the one before that. And it doesn't matter that we're older, whether we know how to use every kind of technical thing or not. We don't have to know how to use it, but it's still upon us anyway. Because everywhere you look, everything is instant. And everybody at this point usually has some kind of phone, even if it's a flip phone. It doesn't have to be a smartphone. But it doesn't it seem like, because I'm noticing, even on our smartphones, we used to just get telemarketers to bug us and, and be a nuisance at dinner time. Now they're invading the cell phone. So they're calling you on that. I mean, it's like you don't have, it's, it's very challenging to just get some time that's just quiet where you don't just have a whole lot of stuff going on. It's just a lot of stimuli all the time, all the time. And we have to understand that we've got to just take a moment and just adjust our thinking. And you need to do that almost, not almost, you got to do that on a daily basis because there's no free lunch in the sense that the enemy is always on his job. So you have to make sure you keep him in check. And he should almost be fearful of you. When he sees you wake up in the morning, he needs to be the one that's shuddering, not the other way around. We shouldn't even have to be concerned. He should be nervous every time you open your eyes and say, good morning, Father. He should be ready to go on tranquilizers just because you are up, because you are the one that has authority over all of his ability. But if you don't know that, because you don't have the knowledge of that, then he's got you right where he wants you to be. You see, everywhere we turn, it's either visual or audible information that's coming in at us. And it almost seems like instead of 24 hours a day, you could almost say it's 30 hours a day, okay? And instead of seven days a week, it almost seems like the weeks are double, okay? I mean, it's just ridiculous. That's how much everything is just constantly pouncing on top of us. Now, Paul is telling us that Bible knowledge will cause us to prosper, or knowledge and its proper use wins battles. He tells us that. Therefore, it seems logical to conclude that when we experience defeat, the probable reason is either ignorance, we didn't know, or failure to properly use what we do know. Now see, we don't want to talk about that because that doesn't sound glamorous and that's not cute, but it's real, okay? Because some of the things that we endure it's because either we were ignorant of the word and we didn't know, okay, or we didn't apply what we do know, okay? So here's something else to think about. Ignorance and victory, ignorance and victory are impossible roommates, okay? 
They can't occupy the same space. Since we found out <laughs> that knowledge and its proper use wins battles, then the opposite must also be true. Ignorance and victory can't live together. Just like we know oil and water don't mix, we know that. We know that faith and fear don't occupy the same space. Well, victory and ignorance don't as well. So the person who lacks Bible language, language, same thing. The person who lacks Bible knowledge is like a man on a battlefield without any armor. Now that's really something when you think about it, okay? He's an easy target. And it's really exactly what the enemy wants for all of us. He wants, why do you think he does everything he can to keep us ignorant? Why do you think there are so many churches, even to this day, where the person, the pastor or teacher, whoever, will get up and, and give you a text, which I've always thought was very interesting. But anyway, give you a text. They'll read a verse and put the Bible somewhere, and then go off into whatever they're going to share. Now, a lot of times they're sharing things that pertain to the word. A lot of times they're sharing a lot of things that could pertain to all those commercials that come on TV, so that you get all excited and you think you had a wonderful show, like this was Showtime at the Apollo, and you can go home and still be sick and have all kinds of problems all week for you to come back and repeat the same thing. And the enemy lets these churches go on. He is happy for them. They can be full to the brim because they are supporting what he wants. Because if he can destroy people, why not? That's a great way to do it, which is why we have to understand that and don't fall prey to it. But it's up to us not to. So again, Hosea 4.6 tells us, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I think that that word destroyed is a very good word. It doesn't say that my people are set back for a lack of knowledge. It doesn't say my people are disappointed for a lack of knowledge. It says they are destroyed. And that is a serious word. God Almighty, the Heavenly Father, is giving information about his own people. He's not giving us an evaluation based on people other than his own. I mean, <laughs> knowledge and its proper use wins battles. God says, look at it this way, if I am defeated in life, then either, number one, I am ignorant, meaning I don't have any knowledge, or number two, <laughs> I'm disobedient and not doing what I've been told to do. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We all know that. Doesn't that tell us that God had to pre-exist the creation? Because, I mean, obviously, how could he create it if he didn't pre-exist? If he didn't exist, he couldn't have created anything. So if we believe the biblical story, and Christians do believe the Bible, even those that are ignorant and aren't reading it, they still believe it, <laughs> okay, that tells us that God existed. It also tells us that God doesn't need the creation to be God. Apparently, he was already God before he created the creation. So think about this. So what does God care if you get your behind kicked for all of your life? I mean, really, why should he care? What does God, what does God care about whether you're in bankruptcy or not? What does he care whether or not you are sick and you can barely make it out of the house. What does he care if you don't have any food to feed your kids and you're trying to figure out how in the world you're gonna do that? What does he really care? If, if any of these things exist, it doesn't change God. He's still God and he's still sitting on that throne. Just because you are <laughs> bankrupt or just because you're sick or just because you don't have food in your house or you don't know how you're going to feed your kids or you don't know how you're going to make ends meet and yada, 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 and can go on and on and on. <laughs> just because you are in a marriage that you absolutely hate and you can't wait to get divorced and just because you're a person who you can't figure out how come it seems like God passed you by and you've wanted to be married your whole life and it's never happened, what is any of that to God? I mean, why should he care? But he must care. And he's trying to help us so that we 
can maximize the purpose of our existence. Yeah. See, that's the key. We were all given the opportunity to enter into this earth realm for a reason. I don't care how you got here. I don't care if you never met your parents. I don't care if you were an orphan. I don't care if they found you in a trash can somewhere. God is the only creator of life. You are here for a purpose and for a reason. So why does he care about any of this? Because he wants you to fulfill that purpose for the very reason that he created you. <laughs> God didn't create us to suffer. He didn't create us to be all out of shape. He didn't create us to be sad. He didn't create us to be down in the dumps. He didn't create us, you know, to be poor, to be lacking. All of the things that we have a tendency at some point in our life to battle. That's not what he created us for. I mean, it's funny, and I shared this with somebody else, but... I was having a conversation, and it was funny because I was having this conversation, I just had it with my husband coming in, and we were talking about something totally different, but I said to him, I said, you know, I just know, I know like I know my name. When I made my entrance into this earth realm, I was meant to be loved. I was meant to have plenty of anything and everything that God wanted me to have. I'm not meant to be poor. Meaning some people, maybe they're okay with it and they think, all right, you know, this is the lot in life I have. And I never even thought that. I mean, and this isn't even anything that my parents, like, told me or anything. Because I grew up, I mean, think about it. I thought I was saved and wasn't even saved. So obviously there was a lot missing. <laughs> okay, but I knew. I just instinctively knew that I'm just supposed to have all that God wants me to have. It's just in me. So I'm not going to stop and I'm not going to quit until I get all that he has from me. But the thing is, he wants me to have it. So I mean, it just makes sense. I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. And you know what? As much as I think I am one of his favorites, I know he wants all of you to have it too. I mean, so he wants all of us to have everything. It's not just me. He really wants all of us to have it. But the thing is, we have to know that. We have to know that. So, if our minds aren't straight and they're all out of whack because we're trying so hard to make it in this thing called life and we don't take the time or find the time to study the word, to see what he has for us and wants us to have, all of that's on us. It's not on him. But if we don't understand that knowledge wins the battles, then we're always going to have problems because here's the thing that you have to think about. God is seated where? On the throne. He has already done everything that he needs to do for us. So if there is anything that you are believing God for, if there is anything that you genuinely in your heart want and you want to achieve and you want it in your hand, he's already done it for you. All you have to do is get the knowledge through the word and operate. You know, you hear them say, work the word. And, you know, when you're first coming along as a baby Christian, or at least for me, I was like, work the word? What does that mean? I know how to work a job. I've been doing that. Okay? But I'm serious. These aren't things people talk about. But I didn't know. What does it mean, work the word? It means find out what's in the word. And then, like we said earlier, put on your knowledge of that word and apply it to your life. And then you will see that you can win because he's already done everything for you. And I, I just, I love that. So we already know that he said that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The word destroyed is a combat term. Just like I said before, if they use the word destroyed. It indicates that a battle was waged and somebody lost. Now, there's another revelation that we need to think about. So turn with me to the book of Isaiah. And we're going to look at Isaiah 5, verse 13. Isaiah 5, verse 13. And let me know when you're there. Okay, great. So if we look at this in, I'm going to read it out of the expanded Bible. 
And it says, because if we just read it in the New King James, which is wonderful, it says, therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Well, the expander says, so my people will be captured. See, I like that even better, okay? They'll be captured and taken away, be deported, go into exile, captivity, because they don't really know me or lack understanding. All the great people, their nobles, men of honor, will die of hunger, and the common people, multitudes, masses, will die of or will be parched with thirst. If we look at it in the contemporary English version, it's shorter, and it says, and so his people know nothing about him. That's why many of you will be dragged off to foreign lands. Your leaders will starve to death, and everyone else will suffer from thirst. And the Amplified Classic says, therefore, my people go into captivity to their enemies. That's what it means to go into captivity. Without knowing it, and because they have no knowledge of God. And their honorable men, their glory, are famished, and their common people are parched with thirst. Hosea tells us that ignorance can cause our destruction. And now, Hosea, tell, I mean, I, <laughs> Hosea tells us this now. Isaiah is telling us really the same thing, that ignorance can take us into captivity. That's really dangerous when you think about it. I mean, because I like how it says in the expanded that we can be deported and go into captivity. In other words, you can be so ignorant that you don't even know sometimes what you're doing. Meaning, you know, you're not thinking about it. You're just kind of like going along with the crowd. You know, and, and you're not, and I'm not saying you're doing it on purpose. You're just not really stopping to think. And it affects everything you do. Like some people, and there are some believers who feel like, well, I don't like who was up for election, so I'm just not going to go and vote. Because why should I bother? Now, even though I know that I'm supposed to pay attention to the law of the land, which has given me the ability to vote, oh, I'm not going to go vote. Or I'm just going to go and pull the lever for this person because this person, oh, I don't know, they're they say they're not against abortion, so that's okay, so I'll pull the lever for them. We're just kind of like going through life not counting the cost, not paying attention. And then if we're not careful, then we have to stand against being led into captivity. I'm not about trying to do that. I already told you how I'm supposed to have everything that God wants, and captivity is not it. So therefore, I have got to continue studying and staying on top of things so that I can have all that he wants me to have. And I'm just saying, please join me in that, because I think that that's the same way you want to feel. You want to have all that he has. So we got to be on our game and pay attention, OK? This indicates that the person who lacks knowledge of the truth of salvation, righteousness, and faith will allow thoughts into his life that, if accepted, will lead to captivity and destruction. We simply cannot accept just any thought that comes into our minds. We have to be selective. Now, I'm going to share something else with you. And I had so much I wanted to say, and I know I'm not going to be able to do it. But here's the thing. We have to also be careful because I want you to think of yourself as this wonderfully made, beautiful creation that God has created. You don't think of yourself as a dumpster, do you? No, no right? You don't think of yourself as a nasty trash can that those Wonderful workers take the stuff and put it in there. OK, you don't think of yourself that way, right? Which means don't accept any thought that comes to you or any it can even be a believer who comes to you with something to say that does not line up with the word of God and allow them to deposit that into your life because then you are demoting your own self, diminishing your own self from this wonderful creation God made, and you're making yourself a dumpster because you're just accepting whatever trash somebody is giving to you. You cannot do that because people, without realizing it, I'm not saying they're always doing it on purpose. I'm not saying that because I, I like to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. But sometimes they don't even realize what they're saying, and they can be depositing literal trash into your life. Don't allow it to happen because 
whatever thoughts you start to deal with, it affects your belief system, whether you recognize it or not. And then just like that little scenario I gave you about whether you're going to receive catching a cold or whether or not you're going to tell it no, it's not coming here, any information that someone says to you that doesn't line up can do the same thing. So you must be very, very careful. Because that is what the enemy deals with, our thoughts. And he gives plenty of ideas and suggestions. He's constantly bombarding us with thoughts for the purpose of enticing us to accept and act on them, even though they may be contrary to the word of God. And if we don't have knowledge about our salvation, righteousness, the truth, the gospel of peace, and the word of God, we can easily be taken captive. <laughs> and I mean, we see this really all the time, where Christians, they're coming to church defeated and victimized, literally, by the circumstances. What is it? Their thoughts are not in line with the word of God. There is a warfare going on in our minds. And in their particular instance, they're losing the battle because they are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. They've gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. You see, it's not enough to just listen to someone else telling you their story. That's nice. It's not enough for you to just come here and hear the word. That's a wonderful thing. I'm not knocking it. And I'm not knocking you sharing with other people and, and them being built up by what it is you're going to share. All those things are good. But what I'm saying to you is that's not enough. Because you see, it's wonderful. You know, sometimes we sing the songs, let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich. All of that's beautiful and it's good. But you need more than that. I need to understand when it says, let the weak say I am strong. Where does that say that in the word? That sounds nice. Is it a poem? Is it something that Emily Dickinson wrote? Or did the word of God say that? Because it doesn't say anywhere that I can stand on what Emily Dixon, uh, Emily Dixon, <laughs> whatever, anybody. It doesn't tell me I can stand on somebody else. But it tells me I can stand on the word. But if I don't know that to be true for myself, then I'm just getting what? Hearsay. And I'm sure any place that we go, even in courts of law, correct me if I'm wrong, hearsay doesn't mean anything. They want evidence of what's going on. The word is our evidence, not somebody else's hearsay. So you need to know for yourself what the word of God says. You can't just be sitting up listening to that. That is just not enough. <sighs> OK, so what is it? <laughs> Many people are being held captive by their own out of control minds. They're captive to so many things. They're captive to drugs. They're captive to alcohol. They're captive to cigarettes. They're captive to sex. I know people don't want to talk about that. They're captive to all kinds of weird, crazy, destructive things. But it all starts where? In the mind. Where does the suggestion come from that a person who's a junkie wants to go somewhere and meet the drug dealer to get a fix? Where does that come from? It starts here first, OK? Where does the whole thing, even you know, they have movies about this, where did the whole expression of booty call come from? You first have to think about it. It doesn't just jump on you, OK? So the point is, it's a thought that starts. But here's what I want you. Now, we know all of the illicit, weird stuff. We all say, oh, no, that's not us. We, we wouldn't think of that. We're believers. You know, we, we don't think of booty calls, and we're not going anywhere to ask for fixes. We're not doing that because we're members of Crenshaw Christian Center, New York. Praise the Lord. But, but OK, <laughs> you may be a person who's sitting up, and you may have wanted to be married. And you can't figure out, why hasn't that happened yet? How come I'm not getting anybody to call me for a date? I mean, I do everything right, I think. How come that's not happening for me? Or you may be a person that's like, boy, I'm a female, and not only am I not even getting anybody to call for a date, my biological clock is really, you know, almost past due. These eggs are getting ready to be cooked, okay? 
<laughs> so what am I supposed to do? You know, because I mean, I know what they tell me is going to happen at 50, and I'm like 47 and a half. So I mean, come on, what's supposed to happen? We don't think about Sarah, okay, and those possibilities. We just think about what it is that it is saying to us in the natural. So that is no different than the junkie who's looking for a fix. And last but not least, because I know my time is over, but last but not least, we may be sitting with a pile of bills and we honestly have no idea where the money is gonna come to pay for them. Well, rather than going around with your face all twisted and looking all evil and angry and upset, guess what? You can't change anything about it but exercise your faith anyway. So you might as well have what? The joy of the Lord, which is your strength, and know that he cares for you. He loves you. He's done everything that he's going to do. So you just need to step up on your knowledge to find out what it is that you need to do so that you can do what? So that you can win. Praise God. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We also offer the convenience of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, East O for offering, or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K. C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting East AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.
We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K.C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting EAST AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.